All right, we're going to get this thing started because I want to get home before midnight. Uh, I'm Jim Christie. I'm a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, and I'm uh, currently assigned to the uh, Defense Cyber Crime Center. Uh, what we're going to do this, this evening, um, uh, we have multiple federal agencies in, uh, uh, represented here, as well as uh, uh, Sydney, Australia Police Department. And uh, kind of what we're going to do is kind of what we've done in the past. What we're going to do is do a quick little bio on uh, each of our uh, uh, panelists, let them make an opening statement, and then we're just going to open it up to questions from uh, uh, the floor. So uh, first, uh, Jason Beckett. Jason Beckett, raise your hand, please. Uh, is the director of the State Electronic Evidence Branch for the Special Services Group of the New South Wales Police Department, uh, Sydney, Australia. Former inspector with the Special Services Group. Uh, he went to uh, the corporate world as a godless contractor for a while and then came back to the government uh, in 2003. Um, holds numerous uh, 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 degrees and uh, he's, he's just a, a nice guy too. And you, you'll have to pardon that southern accent that he has. Uh, Tim Fowler, NCIS, and uh, Tim is active duty Marine Special Agent, uh, has worked in the cy as a cyber agent for the Naval Criminal Investigative Service in Washington, D.C. for the last six years. Tim has 19 years active duty uh, experience, and uh, in 2004, Tim was awarded the Bronze Star with Combat Valor Device by the Secretary of the Navy for his media exploitation efforts in Iraq. So, thank you. He, he begged me not to say all that. Andy Freed uh, from our, our favorite agency, the IRS. Andy is a... Uh, <laughs> Usually there's a target on the other side of it, so somebody's... Uh, Andy is a uh, senior special agent with, the tre uh, with Treasury, uh, Inspector General for Tax Administration, System Intrusion, Network Attached. Holy God, that's a, a Synarch. Uh, uh, 17 years uh, experience with uh, Treasury, and I actually met uh, Andy uh, back in 86 uh, when he first went to work for IRS, and he had just left the Kennedy Space Center where, uh, a as a security guy, he actually developed the forensic software that everybody in law enforcement used in those days, and as we point out to him, it wasn't forensically sound in those days, so we, we now buy commercial products. Um, <laughs> But most of the people that were wrongfully accused have been released by now. <laughs> most. <laughs> uh, uh, Bob Hopper, National White Crawler Crime Center, raise your hand so they see you. Uh, manages the computer crime section. Uh, Hop manages, uh, uh, is an instructor cadre, manages the instructor cadre for N uh, W3C in West Virginia. Does anybody ever go out to West Virginia? For West by Virginia. Uh, Hop just retired about a year ago with nearly uh, 30 years experience with the Arizona Department of Public Safety and 37 years in law enforcement. Uh, Hop's a law enforcement career, you know, he did lots of drugs. Oh no, you investigated drugs uh, and, and air smuggling. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, Bob. Tim Hoff, FBI CART. Um, Got his uh, uh, computer and information systems degree uh, from Jacksonville University and was a U.S. Uh, Naval officer from uh, 85 to uh, 96. Then we kicked him out of the service and he went to work for the FBI because they'll take anybody. I was assigned to uh, Pittsburgh Field Office in 1997 and is the uh, uh, chief of the uh, uh, FBI's computer analysis response team and he's the unit chief for those guys. Um, uh, Dave Thomas, and I can't find your bio, Dave. Oh, right, Mike Jacobs. Oh, man, somebody messed with my... Mike Jacobs, uh, SRA. Got, got groupies, cool. Uh, Mike joined SRA in October 2002 as a senior advisor following his retirement from federal government service, 38 years. Uh, in March 2003, he was appointed to the director's uh, SRA's uh, cyber and national security program. Pri prior to that, I don't know what the hell is SRA stand for. System integrator. System integrator. 
I don't know what that means either. Um, prior to that, um, Mike was the Information Assurance Director at uh, National Security Agency, NSA, no such agency. Under his leadership, uh, NSA became implementing... That's all right. Okay, yeah, you, you can read it online. Thank you. It was getting, it was getting long. Uh, Ken Privet, raise your hand, Ken. Okay, so that, this is a test to see if they know who they are. Uh, U.S. Postal Service Inspector General. Ken presently works as a special agent in charge of the Computer Crime Unit uh, for U.S. Postal Office uh, Inspector in General. Conducts uh, computer intrusion investigations and provides computer forensic support uh, to, uh, to a force of over 450 agents. Uh, I, I met Ken uh, probably about 10, 12 years ago. He was a Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS agent. Uh, he defected, went to Defense Criminal Investigative Service, and DOD kicked him out and he went to postal. He went postal. <laughs> Dave Thomas, FBI, was designated as a special agent back in 1989. Uh, he, Mr. Thomas was appointed chief of the uh, Cyber Division uh, Criminal Computer Intrusion Unit in 2001, and um, he's directing the FBI's efforts in many large-scale uh, cyber investigations, and some of you may know him personally. following a rights advisement. And, and um, last but not, oh, and we got Jerry Dixon, I'm sorry. And Jerry, you didn't give me a bio, so you, he's a Fed cert, so when we go through, if you tell him what you do and why you do it and who you do it to. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Linton Wells is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Networks and uh, Information uh, Integration. Been my boss multiple times through the years. Um, and you know you'll see more of him later. Okay, now if we could start at this end of the table, and if you'd make your uh, two-minute short statement, advertising your agency, please. I uh, Ken Privet, and I work with the uh, Postal Service Inspector General's Office. I'm the agent in charge of the Computer Crimes Unit, and. Um, <coughs> Just, uh, just one thing to say, if anybody owns any postal systems out there, if you could just write the IP on your card and just pass it up to the front, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Nine o'clock in Vegas. What are you people doing here? Um, I'm with you. I, I should be. I don't know. Yeah, this is like my eighth DEF CON, uh, fourth time, or third time uh, meet the Fed. Um, my agency basically is a, a tax agency, for those of you that are not in, inside the U.S. And basically what we do in my group is we're primarily the internal security people. Uh, in that position, we do a lot of the computer intrusions, network denial of service attacks, and uh, phishing sites. That's pretty much what I do now, full time. So am I. <laughs> Uh, no. My name is uh, Tim Fowler. Uh, again, I work for the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, uh, specifically for the uh, Cyber Department. Uh, Naval Criminal Investigative Service is a uh, uh, civilian uh, law enforcement agency, a uh, federal law enforcement agency. And uh, uh, specifically with the uh, Cyber Department, we work computer crime investigations, both criminal, counterintelligence, uh, counterterrorism operations, and investigations. Uh, so we work the full scope of, of the cyber field. but. Uh, that's pretty much it. Do you like the TV show? Uh, well, actually, we do stuff that even make Mark Herman jealous sometimes. <laughs> uh, g'day. Um, my name's Jason Beckett. I'm from uh, Sydney, Mississippi. <laughs> the very southern accent. <laughs> the land down under. Um, uh, even though uh, we are from uh, what uh, I've been called a backward country, we're actually the third largest uh, law enforcement agency in the world. Um, as a result, uh, we have one of the largest uh, forensic uh, labs in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we're both a, a sworn and unsworn uh, section. Uh, most of our staff come uh, ex-military or uh, academia um, uh, or for a variety of other uh, commercial and consulting organisations. Uh, we look at uh, the full gambit of um, computer security and uh, computer forensics uh, for um, uh, New South Wales and uh, most of uh, the high-end uh, investigations for Australia. Uh, Mike Jacobs uh, with SRA International. SRA International is a system integrator 
Its uh, principal client is the federal government, and we have a fairly large practice in the information assurance domain. And one of the things I've been doing in each of the DEF CONs that I've come out to is try to recruit additional talent. And last year, uh, it was T-shirts for resumes. This year, the recruiting budget is down. Uh, this year, we have fancy NSA refrigerator magnets for resumes. <laughs> now, but th these are rather special refrigerator magnets. You can apply them either to your refrigerator, your desk, or your metal headboard. It's up to you. But we'll and, have a half a dozen of them for a half a dozen resumes. And, and, and the transmitter only works about 300 yards. <laughs> You're up. Give a call. Hi, I'm Bob Hopper with the... How many of you, in, raise, but raise your hand if you've ever heard of the National White Collar Crime Center. All those people that raise their hands are probably cops. <laughs> <laughs> you might make a note of that. We, we are uh, a non-profit, uh, DOJ-funded uh, corporation that provides free, at no cost, uh, training to law enforcement all over the United States. My focus with the computer crime section is to provide uh, computer forensics training and cyber investigations training. Uh, we uh, move police officers from entry level to uh, through advanced level training with computer forensics all over the United States. Nonprofit. I don't have any magnets to give you. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tim Huff. I'm uh, with the computer analysis response team with the FBI. We do computer forensics for the Bureau. Uh, we also help out state and local when, whenever we're requested. We have about uh, 90 different sites across the country uh, doing computer forensics. We have about uh, <coughs> 250 to 300 examiners right now. We're still expanding. We also have the regional computer forensic labs, uh, 14 of those across the country where we provide uh, personnel for those sites as well. Lynn Wells from the Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, just off to a factoid, which is that uh, in the next five years, roughly 40 percent of the uh, Department of Defense's uh, civilian acquisition workforce is going to become eligible for retirement. There will be enormous opportunities for people with imagination, talent, and uh, initiative, which represents most of you out here in the audience. And just think, pardon? And it depends on what you're doing, actually. Uh, anyway, so there are opportunities. Uh, and at the same time, the network is becoming critically important to the department. In fact, uh, there's probably going to be a report released in the next few weeks that's going to call it the most single, important single integrating thing in the Department of Defense. So there's a lot of opportunities, again, for those of you out here to uh, uh, come learn more about us and really help us draw on your skill sets. Thanks. <coughs> Good evening, Dave Thomas from the FBI. This reminds me, being growing up in the state of Tennessee, this reminds me of a large-scale tent revival. So if any of you feel the power and the spirit moving you, we're empowered to take confession 24 hours a day, so please come on forward. <laughs> the, uh, uh, my, my, my job within the FBI is I'm in charge of all counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and criminal computer intrusion investigations for the FBI. I also have our cyber action teams, which deploy worldwide in the event of any cyber emergency. Thank you. We appreciate you coming. Jerry Dixon, I uh, run the uh, U.S. CERT operations. Uh, basically, we do the uh, federal incident response and coordination across the federal agencies. Uh, we work with a lot of the uh, critical infrastructure owner and operators. Obviously, uh, we do a lot in the uh, vulnerability management disclosure area as well. Some of you uh, we've talked to, uh, you know, since uh, starting with Black Hat. So, uh, if you have vulnerabilities, definitely look us up. Um, especially if you're, you know, not getting the progress that you would like to see from uh, some of the vendors, we can a lot of times we can assist with that. And uh, we do have jobs posted out there on uh, USAJobs.gov. So uh, we're always looking for uh, some good talent. Okay, before we start with the questions, um, we thought turnaround is a fair fair play. You guys play spot the Fed. So we're going to play a little game here ourselves. It's going to be called Spot the Lamer. Okay. So uh, these two guys are going to pick out uh, the top six lamers that they find in the audience. You must come up, stand out in front of here. 
Quickly, quickly. Marcus, send your daughter up. <laughs> We're gonna do we'll, that. We'll do that for you. We gotta hold <laughs> Okay. Just, just line up right, right here. How many do we have here? The guy with number two down there. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. We got six. Okay. Uh, I get to ask the first question, and then each panelist will get to answer a question, and, we'll, and you just point to the person you want to answer the question. Uh, one down here, she's six. Okay, number one, did your mother sew your name in your underwear? <laughs> no? No. Okay, next question, Ken. <laughs> Very good. Ken. Um, number two, have you ever participated in a Star Trek marathon? No, sir, I'm a Star Wars fan. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Number five, have you ever gone to a family reunion to pick up checks? <laughs> Only boys in the family, it's worse. <laughs> Number four, uh, have you uh, recompiled your kernel yet today? Yesterday, not today. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, do you have a copy of Frack in your bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a hand raised? <laughs> Somebody Number six. Do you live in your parents' basement? I live on the second floor. Uh, <laughs> second floor. <laughs> You're up, God. Second floor. Number four. Microphone. Uh, number four. Are your best friends on our IRC channel? Your best friends. <laughs> your, your only friends. <laughs> 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 Number three, can you speak fluent hex? Yes. Number, Number one, what, is, what does LMAO mean? LMAO? Laugh my ass off. All right. Got it. Yeah. Hey. 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 <laughs> Number three, did you ever get caught playing with a three inch floppy? <laughs> <laughs> Number five, can you name the entire Skywalker family? Okay, now we're going to let you guys vote. So if you think number one is the lamer, let me hear it. <laughs> okay, you can sit down. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, no, no, three, come back whoa, here. Come on back. Only number one can sit down. <laughs> number two. Let me get the Marines to say, wait for it. Mm. You, number two, you can sit down. Number three. <laughs> number three, you could stay. <laughs> number four. <laughs> number four can sit down. Number five. Number five can stay. Number six. Come on. All right. Number six can sit down. Now we're down to the last two. Okay, we'll go in reverse order. Well, we have, we have a special prize for you. We have a NSA mug. And a free vacation.
Okay. At this point, it's up to you guys. Uh, there are only one microphone so that everybody can hear you. So if you want to line up behind the microphone and ask a question, you can direct it at any particular agency like IRS. <laughs> Am I going to get audited this year? Yes. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. I guess I'd like to primarily uh, uh, direct this to the FBI, but of course, everybody, I'd like to hear anything any of you have to say. This is a question that I just asked the EFF less than an hour ago. I'm really fascinated to hear your guys' side of this. Right now, what is being done, or what are you guys thinking about doing, to force corporations, when they're sending our personal financial data overseas to third-party companies, to force them to be accountable for our personal financial data? We are the data owners. They are just the stewards of our data. Amen. Yeah, I, think, I mean, we're not in the business, of course, to force companies to do anything. If that's something that you feel very strongly about, which is what you do, then you should talk to your congressmen, talk to your senators, and have legislation passed to prevent that. That's the right way to do it. Can you guys investigate, though? If you oh, want to ask a line. question, you'll have to get in the flipping line. <laughs> This is the postal. I have a concern at my apartment. Don't make him angry, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the problem I have is I just moved into this apartment complex, and uh, every day I go to the uh, post office box, and they have a, a trash can right there. And I have found numerous letters, and for at least first class mail in there. I've even seen a bill thrown in the trash can. Hmm. Um, I know this. Uh, you guys are federal agents, so that, isn't that a federal offense for throwing mail in the trash can right there by the box? Not if it's your own. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, are well, you the one that threw it in the trash? So, okay, yeah. if it's not my trash, yeah, I understand that one. In, in but, all, all seriousness, uh, yeah, see me afterwards, please. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Tr mail in the trash that hasn't been opened is a bad thing. This is uh, for Mr. Jacobs. Do you have any teenagers living in your basement? <laughs> I have a follow-up on that. Are they yours? I, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear the subject. Do I have what living in my basement? Teenagers. Not anymore, thank God. <laughs> So uh, I, I see that we got a lot of different agencies up here. I'm curious about you know your take on how you guys overlap, and then your opinion on are we set up correctly right now from a governmental standpoint to combat cybercrime? What for a lab perspective? <laughs> Come on, panel. I didn't have you up here for nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't hear all of it. Is that pointing towards the lab? No, I mean, you have a lot of different jurisdictional boundaries, right? And so, I mean, to us, in terms of consumers or corporations that are combating cybercrime, um, how, how do you guys align against the problem? What degree do you overlap? And then really, organizationally, are we set up correctly at the federal government level to combat it effectively? The, I'll, I'll start off that. The FBI is the lead agency for all counterterrorism, counterintelligence investigations that revolving around cybercrime. Other agencies would feed information they get into the, into us. For a criminal cybercrime, it, it goes across multiple agencies: U.S. Secret Service, Postal, everyone on this on this table. We we react very well, work together, we coordinate. DHS, FBI has people there full time. We have people full time. We have joint terrorism task forces in every FBI field office, which has almost every agency or probably every agency here represented. So the government within the United States works very well and very closely together. All of us have known each other for a long time, which is the reason we're on this panel today, but it works very, very well in the U.S. And I think just, uh, just from an international perspective as well, uh, we've dealt with uh, just about every one of these agencies uh, from uh, either with a local issue or an issue that they've had in our country. And uh, the relationship works very well. And one of the reasons I'm here is to uh, uh, 
keep the relationship going. Okay, so just to redirect that a little bit, are there any redundancies in terms of responsibility now, or is there a need for any greater centralization of authority? I, I don't. Well, I guess I'm speaking to like the Department of Homeland Security in terms of coordination. Of I mean, centralization of authority in this country probably isn't a good thing. And yes, okay. there is overlap. I mean, several agencies have concurrent jurisdiction, but we work it out. We have deconfliction mechanisms. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, let me comment on that just real quickly from a state and local law enforcement perspective, just because that's where I just came from. Uh, there are a number of states around the United States post 9/11 that have made an incredible effort to uh, ramp up their ability to communicate at all levels. Uh, I'm, I'm most familiar with Arizona because that's where I came from, but uh, there are uh, any number of states out there that are, are doing at the state and local level. They're in the what United these, States now? Pardon? Arizona's part of the U.S. now? <laughs> Actually, it's, yeah, just barely. <laughs> Well, it's more of a state than West by God, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> but. All right, this is a question primarily for people that are doing enforcement and uh, actually going after people who are doing cracking on systems. Um, with the topic that was brought up for the discussion, it talks about Boyd's theories on getting inside someone's decision loop and following up after someone and getting in on the weaknesses on their system. Uh, for the crackers that are out here in the audience, a great deal of them actually, that's their bread and butter if they get into the weakness of a system. My question for those of you that are doing enforcement is where are the weaknesses that you can discuss for the crackers where you can get inside their decision loops and you can actually come in and catch them that way? Hmm. <laughs> Anything you can share. <laughs> Perhaps some of the audience could uh, explain how they got caught. Right? Actually, I, I wouldn't mind doing that. <laughs> I wasn't really caught. I actually properly reported certain events through the proper channels and went ahead and had a counterterrorism investigation conducted. Didn't find out until four years later through a Free Information Act. However, I don't know. I think a short answer. The by question kind of like went over the head. Like, could you be more long. specific? <laughs> no, no. What was the question again? <laughs> You're supposed to be asking it. Well, I, I think the other gentleman asked. I, I think how we get involved in computer intrusions. From the IRS standpoint, strictly the IRS standpoint, I can tell you that the only intrusions that we generally will work are those involved in other crimes that primarily deal with phishing, impersonation, or threats. So generally, when we get involved in a case, we find out that at some point an intrusion was made, and, and that's where we get the link in. I hope that answers the other gentleman's question. I just know from personal incidents, usually it's not the intrusion that's caught. It usually goes very undetected. But anyways, I have a question. Uh, traditionally, Meet the Fed has always been a big recruitment thing for the different federal agencies of different governments and everything. Why would anybody from the scientific community want to work under the current Bush administration <laughs> slash regime for an administration that continually tries to silence a lot of the scientific community? Like, what, what incentives are there for us to come work for you? We, have, we make a lot of money. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm not a Democrat. <laughs> I have a question for our FBI friends. Can, can you tell us who the most wanted cyber criminal is and what did they do? Jay Echefani. Jay Echefani is the only computer intrusion person ever on an FBI wanted poster. He was the mastermind of the FUNET investigation, which was the denial of service attacks against his competitors, and he's currently at large. What? Jay Echefani, he's Moroccan. I, I got a question for y'all. I'm not sure who exactly to directed directed to, but there have been a lot of reports in the last few years of people, uh, hackers wouldn't exactly be the correct term, but I guess we can use that for lack of a better one, 
that have found weaknesses in systems and applications, most commonly um, online systems, web systems, through no malicious intent. You know, they may have been looking at something and stumbled upon it. Now, back in the late 90s, memory serves me well, most of these people, when they reported, at least from what I hear, they reported it directly to the company. The company basically thanked them for finding a problem and then fixed it. But now it seems like when they report these issues, they are immediately charged with hacking uh, the systems, cracking into them, and federal charges are brought against them. I'm just wondering from your perspective how you distinguish between a legitimate error that's found in a website uh, versus malicious intent, or is that distinguish, dis, uh, distinction made, or do you just prosecute fully? I'm not. A, do you have a specific example of someone who is arrested for doing that? I can't think of one off the top of my head. No. Because I don't. I don't know of anyone specifically that, through a legitimate purpose, found a vulnerability and reported it to a company that then was arrested by the FBI. Do you have a way to report things anonymously? Absolutely. Okay, that would be a good follow-up question. Then, thank you. Uh, let's say that a vulnerability is found. Then, um, what would be the correct way, safe way, to report that? Who should be reported to? Sir, report it to your local law enforcement. If you've done, I mean, you have to be careful when you're looking at. Again, is did you just accidentally discover vulnerability, or were you probing a system trying to find one? There is a fine line there. You can walk between what is legal and what is not. Right. But most people probably won't encounter a vulnerability during their normal surfing habits. I think, I think if you take a look, I mean, just from October until now, there's been, uh, what, over uh, 5,800 vulnerabilities identified. And, you know, we process, you know, 1,000-plus vulnerabilities. And I, I can't think of any one of those so far that's been reported to, uh, you know, to U.S. CERT or to DHS where somebody's, you know, been prosecuted. You know, under responsible disclosure, you know, obviously, you know, we work with the vendor and, and what have you and try to uh, assess and triage that. So, you know, again, I, I don't know of any specific examples in that one or heard of any. Okay, thank you. Well, I obviously have a question because I'm up here, but uh, <clears throat> good. I've dealt with a few attacks. I've seen uh, some people break in and through forensics we've discovered who it was. And a lot of the time they're in countries that you don't think that we could prosecute like North Korea or Russia or China. I'm wondering what is being done to capture these people and have we had any success? Yes, we've had outstanding success. success. Eighty percent, of, I said, of what we work is international with the FBI. We work cooperatively with the Russian government. We work cooperatively with China. We work cooperatively with, we have a MOU in place with South Korea. I just came back from investigations where we've done in several Eastern European countries. So we have a very outstanding relationship with most countries around the world. All right. <laughs> so, uh, this is kind of a strange question. Uh, I'm in a band called Preteen Pornstar, and I own the domain name preteenpornstar.com. <laughs> Periodically, we get emails that uh, are in really bad English, terrible spelling, asking us for, uh, t you know, are we trading pictures or whatnot of, you know, underage people. And uh, at, at some point, they'll always go into perfect English and say, I know this is illegal, but sort of question. We kind of ignore the emails, but I'm wondering, are, are those cops hunting? If, they, if we were, we wouldn't man, tell you. So, but no. <laughs> but that, but no, that's, that isn't the way law enforcement works. I mean, we're not going to solicit that. Now you're talking about entrapping in, in someone. There is so much right. child pornography and sexual exploitation of children out there going on that we get and see on a daily basis to go out and, and, and create a phishing scheme, if you will, to try to look for someone who's not even predisposed to do it. No one up here has the resources to do that. Right. That type of activity, though, should be reported. So I should forward those to you guys when it happens. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. It gets us hits, man. <laughs> Don't know if I can beat that one. But really. I'm just wondering, does anybody have a neck beard? Have a what? Neck beard. Where? Come on, in the audience. Come on, someone has a neck beard, right? <laughs> Give that man another drink somewhere else. <laughs> Refresh his drink. All right, um, I have a quick question. 
Well, actually, two questions. One, um, smaller companies usually they don't have uh, too much budget for the you know to spend on the security. If they discover something, they say smaller company always go to a local law enforcement, local uh, local law enforcement. They say this is over my head. You know, this is over our head. So here is the content for FBI, and the FBI will just tell them it's like. You have to really lose so much money before we will take care of you. <laughs> so, what is the best way to get around for the smaller company if they think they are they are being attacked or anything like that? Probably the best way is to report it to the Internet Fraud Complaint Center, which we have, where we process 200,000 complaints a month. Your small complaint is if it's aggregated against complaints going across the United States and somewhat sometimes worldwide, may show us that the level of that in incident is actually high enough that we would actually go out and investigate that. So I would encourage you to report those incidents. And again, the, the Internet Fraud Complaint Center online has a website and a forum for doing that. Okay. And the uh, second question, if uh, they still suspecting something's going on, is that the right, is that the right suggestion to actually get them to say, to actually ask, ask them to install this keylogger so they can prove to them, prove to whoever is going to investigate, this is what I did and the versus this is not what I did. Did you get the question? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. I, is that part, I mean, should I, in, should I actually recommend them to install the keylogger so they can actually show all the activities they have done versus the one they have not done? The, should, uh, should the person you report it to, should you ask them to install the keylogger? Is that your question? The yeah, the companies. They, they would have to come to you with specific legal authority and get your consent to do that. But if, the, if any federal agency or state local, for that matter, shows up, then they will tell you what the investigative alternatives are of what they could do and what the legal authorities are they could do that. Okay. Yeah, but the problem is, like, they have to wait for the law, law enforcement to actually tell them what to do. I think that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, you're empowered to protect your own system in any way you see necessary. I see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just uh, want to protect the evidence or show the evidence um, in the long run. So but your system is a system administrator. You can protect your system, yes. I see. Okay. All right, thanks. Meet the Fed's kind of cool. Uh, it's nice to see uh, uh, faces, but it's it's on a national level. Besides going out and uh, breaking the law locally, how can I meet the Fed uh, in my area? <laughs> if, uh, I recognize you, and I think you have. <laughs> how you guys doing? First of all, I'd like to say I spot a Fed. But wait, wait a minute. A couple. People want to answer his question for him, so you yeah, want the, to jump? I, I mean, just just quickly, if most of you belong to companies who work for corporations, there are avenues out there for you to meet your federal law enforcement people. We have within the FBI InfraGuard with over 14,000 members. You can go and look at the InfraGuard website, but it's a place where other companies can get together and discuss vulnerabilities, issues that's going on. Secret Service has their electronic crimes task forces in almost every city across the country. So there's multiple avenues out there that if you want to develop a relationship with local law enforcement officers that you can. You may You're or up. may not. All right, I know you guys' official position is to enforce law as it is, but I just kind of wanted an opinion from the panel as to their, if they think the DMCA goes too far and reverse engineering should be legal or not. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what are you reverse engineering. Excuse me. Talking, it depends. What are you reverse engineering? If you're, reverse I'm saying software in general. I just, to me, it's not really wrong to point out the vulnerabilities and things that other people did. Um, and I think the DMCA has kind of gone backwards on that whole concept. We appreciate your opinion. Well, but I was actually asking for an opinion. I mean, I know what, I know what you guys are going to say. You're going to force the law as it exists. So why right the now. hell did you ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> you got this on tape, right? I didn't hear you actually, but all right. Never mind. You didn't add another drink. Do your agencies have trouble with uh, with investigations being compromised by the actions of corporate security, uh, IT people, people that do um, their own investigation before they allow you to do yours? Yes. Any specifics, yeah. details, examples? How often does it happen, perhaps? 
It happens whenever a uh, corporation doesn't report it immediately and then get some kind of guidance as far as how to preserve the data so it can be you know, maintained in a forensic manner and then testified to in court later on. If they go and do their own investigation, they're going to change things uh, from when the incident actually occurred. If we get a, you know, a pristine or, or exact copy uh, right after it, the, this incident happens, then we can go with that. And if they get in there and fiddle with it themselves and then later on find they can't do what they need to do and they hand it over to us, a lot of things have changed. We can't testify to things we didn't do ourselves. So, in, yes. in many cases, we've seen cases where the uh, individual organization or agency or company has done their own investigation, think they have fixed the problem, and then finally decided to report it once we did the, uh, the deep forensics on it. We found that they hadn't fixed the problem, they had tainted evidence, and they were st still at risk the whole time that they had this, uh, uh, they thought that they were fixed. So, Is this something you run into on a daily basis, or is it more rare than that? I mean, it, I, I just wonder if that is that uh, large percentage of what you deal with is compromised that way to where you're unable to do your job, or is that a, not a very big problem? I think we can recover. It doesn't kill the case. It makes it much more difficult uh, to work. But most cases, it doesn't. It doesn't end the investigation. Thank you. Hey, good evening. This is a follow-up to the comment of the gentleman from the office of the Secretary of Defense. If we have if, you, if this is true and there's a whole swath of retirement coming up, the skill sets that are needed from our computer science graduate and CS programs, are, are you happy with the crop that you have here or do we have to, um, do we have to move more to trade school kind of stuff like the Chinese do in our uh, overseas? And this is actually a question to all of the panel. What do you expect from a computer science undergraduate and graduate education so that it can work in your agencies? I think a lot of the students we get from uh, the scholarship for service uh, 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 programs are really hot. I mean, these guys are really sharp. Uh, in fact, I have a couple of them that are here with us today. And uh, they're tremendous. And I need more of them. And what I need them to do is to uh, uh, toe the line before they come to work for us so they're clearable. I, I would echo that. I just hired two uh, little geniuses straight out of college, uh, but uh, one of the we have the same challenge. I mean, you, you got to sit down and, and take a polygraph, folks. Uh, Maybe I'll have a follow-up question there. A few useful indiscretions and so on. Will they disqualify you from the jobs for the federal agency? People have told me they didn't register for selective service. They cannot become postmen anymore. Is that still the situation? You, you run afoul of a few federal laws and then you're eligible for employment in any of your agencies? Not forever. Not forever. Not Never. forever. Okay. But if you were doing it last week, you would probably be ineligible. <laughs> you could be president. <laughs> hey there. Uh, so I'm a taxpayer, so you guys work for me. Yeah. So. Do, do you Give him a magnet. <laughs> so, uh, do you in fact pay taxes, though? I do, sir. Yes, <laughs> on everything I make, actually. So, um, but I've also been a, I'm actually still am a security consultant, and I've done some work for the government. And one thing that I've been very unimpressed with is the level of engagement of the open source security community in the government. Um, I'm very impressed with the SE Linux project, and at one point, as some of you may know, you were helping to fund OpenBSD. Something happened there, and, it, and some of that funding went away. Um, MITRE, CVE, things like that are a step in that direction, but I wonder, at a government-wide level, is there an understanding that all this intelligence that you guys are sharing, if you would share that with those of us in the security community in the outside world, instead of using these canned vendor tools, um, and I also think it's a budgetary responsibility thing when I see these deep pocket contracts that you guys have with certain vendors in the Atlanta and DC area, whenever open source alternatives exist for these tools that will do everything that these tools will do. And this is the days of cuts in funding and fewer and fewer resources for you guys. So share with us, share with SourceForge, share with the security community and use all these big brains that you guys, you guys have got to help the security community as a whole instead of throwing money at these vendors. 
And I guess that's a question. So, so I'm waiting for a government-wide open source security initiative, and I'd like to reap the benefits of that, as would the rest of us in the security community. So, so first off, there's a lot of great tools. You know, as you know, since you've been a security consultant to the government, there's a lot of tools that get developed from uh, a lot of the folks that support the government in-house. A lot of that gets distributed. A lot of that turns into, uh, you know, just take a look at, uh, you know, some of the work with uh, Snort back in the day. Yeah, I think started. probably a lot of people here saw the picture on Insecure Org of uh, President Bush down at the, uh, I believe it was the NSA, sitting next to a screen with, uh, you know, Snort and, and Map Output and a bunch of other cool stuff. Right, 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 securitywizardry.com. Um, but, you know, we all we kind of saw that and like, wow, that's cool. Maybe those guys are really doing the same stuff we are. But in my experience, all I saw was I, I came in and, and did some work for some assessment uh, work for an agency, and they had a big, stupid contract with a vendor that they tried to scan hundreds of thousands of systems with this particular tool and it didn't work and they weren't meeting their FISMA compliance well, you know, and all that stuff. And before you go too far down the path there, I mean, there's a lot of efforts, you know, science technology within DHS. There's an engagement with a lot of open source software out there. I mean, there's a lot of efforts underway. So, I mean, if you want to discuss a little bit more after this, because I know we're running out of time here, hit me up. I'd love to discuss okay. it further. Yeah, just would like to see more of that, I guess, is what D we're saying. DOD just had a major open technology development initiative also in the last, what, three weeks or so. so. Uh, hi. I know that you guys are all up here recruiting, or most of you are. Can you talk about ways that people who aren't formally trained in security or who don't have computer science degrees might have a, a way into your various agencies, those that are interested in being feds but don't have the acronym at the end of their name or the degree to go along with it? Well, let me, let me start off with uh, Defense Cyber Crime Center. Most of the folks who come to work for us have no background with the government, no clearances uh, before they get there, and uh, they come in as contractors. Uh, so we're, we're looking for talented folks that are trainable. We're going to teach you how to do the job. Yes, without college degrees. I'm looking for talented people. I just spent five and a half hours last night with somebody who didn't have a high school degree. One of the most talented, I mean, they've got an expertise, we can use the expertise. Be persistent. Squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Um, can I get a magnet now and send you my resume later? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all righty. Um, no, my, I, I do have a serious question, though. So from the paradigm of a letter of authorization, what would you include, what points would you see fit to be included for a private security contractor who is going to do an assessment, an audit, or a penetration test so that they kind of have, you know, CYA factor for themselves? That is, they're hired by a company they're, they're, they have the authority, and they're going to do this work, an assessment for a company, but within that, that MOU or the LOA, they want to have some points covered. What would those be? Before uh, any company or any client um, engages someone to do that kind of work, uh, they establish and agree to rules of engagement uh, that defines the parameters uh, that the analyst is going to be allowed to deal with. Now that to a degree, so long as you stay within those rules of engagement, those parameters, you are protected. Uh, but it's an agreement between the parties that this is the nature of the work you're doing, these are the limitations in the nature of the work you're doing, and this is what the expectations are of what you produce as a result of right, the work so you're doing. Right, so, but within that agreement, are there some specific, uh, and I don't mean from a civil court perspective, but from a criminal court perspective, are there some ironclad phrases or memorandums that you would want to have in that contract to protect yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the, the contract vehicles can be very specific. Okay. The do's and don'ts are going to be there in, in the rules of engagement. Okay. Okay. So you don't have any specifics that you think that should absolutely be germane to that kind of a... Well, topic. yeah, one specific is don't do anything stupid. All right. All right. No, it looks like we have two minutes, so... Can I get that magnet from 
Yeah. Right, right. You're, you're number one. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's kind of interesting to hear the uh, service for scholarship statement because I'm going into that program, so I'm excited about that. But my question is actually more for the FBI guys. We're doing a lot of training in my university on forensic stuff in general. How many or have you run into cases where companies actually follow proper forensic protocol doing their, re their investigation into a problem and then turn it over to you and how many legal problems would, does that bring up if they actually do follow the proper protocols and stuff? Proper procedure for forensic protocols uh, are determined by the agency or organization that uh, has a forensic lab. And most cases nowadays, they need an accredited lab by some accrediting agency, uh, accrediting body, uh, which the FBI is going through right now uh, for our headquarters labs. I have not run into any occurrence yet where an organization has followed their proper protocol and then handed it over to us uh, and we've had a problem, mainly because the, the basic precepts of, of forensics is make a copy of what you got and don't change it. After that, everything is pretty much easy. Uh, we can always take that image and reconstruct and go with it. Uh, we would prefer not to be you know, told about it later on once they can't figure out what to do. Uh, we can always do parallel efforts, but um, you know, we'll, we'll get what we get and we'll try and, try and help wherever we can as far as the forensic aspects of it. Law enforcement doesn't control crime scenes. We're used to being flexible. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, that was we just got the the okay. X. So uh, appreciate everybody coming. I think some folks up here have uh, things to trade. We're not giving them away. So you got to trade for this stuff. So thanks everybody for coming.